<clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online, Lecture 226. And this is the squint in pediatric ophthalmology, Session 13. Today we have with us Dr. K. Santan Gopal, sir. Thank you, sir, for taking out your time. We're sorry for the little technical glitch that we had. And uh, he'll be speaking on management of amblyopia. I request Pradeep Sharma, sir, to please introduce Santan, sir. Uh, thank you, Rolly. It's uh, a real pleasure to have Dr. Santan Gopal going to talk on management of amblyopia, a subject which is very dear to him. He has uh, done his MBBS from Bangalore Medical College uh, far back in 1978, then his MD Ophthalmology from Ames, uh, New Delhi. He has been a lecturer at CMC Velour and has also been in Benin, Nigeria, Fellowship in Ophthalmology in Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh for two years. And he has been a registrar at St. George's Teaching Hospital Medical School, London, 1986, March. He has worked under the guidance of Mr. Catford a famous strabismologist, Professor J.P. Lee and Professor Fells at Moorfields Eye Hospital, London, and crystallized his concepts in strabismus and amblyopia. He was a consultant at Memorial Hospital, Darlington, UK, 1990. He has worked in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia uh, and Kuwait in 1990. And he has also been a consultant in Luton and Dunstable Hospital. And after 2001, he has been in practice in Bangalore. He has been closely involved in AIOS, KOS, and BOS, and been the secretary of uh, AIOS conference in 2008. An active member of Strabismological Society has delivered over 500 invited lectures. And now today he's going to deliver a lecture on management of amblyopia. So over to Dr. Santhan Gopal. Thank you very much, Pradeep. I'm sure uh, the students have learned a lot earlier about uh, amblyopia from different set of people. And today my talk is on the management of amblyopia. However, it helps to recall what you have learned all these days uh, from various people. What is amblyopia? What exactly is the place where there is a problem in amblyopia? And how do we manage this problem at the place that is mentioned. We can just go on to the next slide, please. So we will go on to the next slide. Uh, no, it, is got, uh, it has got a wrong file. OK, hold on a second. It has got wrong file to you, Deepti. Uh -huh. So amblyopia is considered as uh, weakness of one of the eyes uh, or maybe weakness of both the eyes that is unilateral or bilateral amblyopia and it could be due to a number of factors it could be due to strabismus it could be due to anisometropia it could be due to a problem in the transmission of light like cataract, corneal opacity, etc. And it could be due to uh, any number of factors which are affecting the brain. However, as far as the treatment is concerned, that is, the classification is concerned, we know that it is strabismic amblyopia, anisometropic amblyopia, and sensory deprivation amblyopia or high ametropia. That is, when the refractive error is high, it can give rise to amblyopia. So these are the four causes of basic amblyopia in any patient. However, our treatment has been only patching. No matter what is the type of amblyopia, the treatment has been only patching. Just give me one second, I'll come. One second. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Uh, Pradeep, sir, would you like to share your thoughts till uh, we have the uh, issue with the slides sorted? Uh, Pradeep, sir, you're muted, sir. Amitabh, sir, uh, you're also around. So we can have a discussion till then uh, between you and uh, Pradeep Sharma, yeah. sir, till we receive the, the, the slides from... The, yes. yeah. you will, no, you, you can screen I'll there. directly project the slides. I'll yeah, project please this. Five minutes. Yeah, please do. It will take... It will take three minutes to project this slide, but I'll keep no problem, talking sir. for these three minutes. 
then the slides will come no now, problem sir. whatever yes. may be the cause of amblyopia the treatment has been given as patching so is patching the correct treatment for all types of amblyopia or there is something else which should be done for treatment of amblyopia in order to understand something else can be done for treatment of amblyopia it's important for you to know where the pathology is in amblyopia to know where the pathology is in amblyopia you need to know the entire process of vision first i'm sure you have been taught everything in the past few days however i would like to recapitulate certain important points from the point of view of management of amblyopia the first important point is the vision is a well organized dichotomous process starting from retina up to cerebral cortex that is v1 in the retina the dichotomy is in right eye and left eye dichotomy is hello yes sir we can hear you yeah in the dichotomy in the the dichotomy in the retina is into p cells and m cells p cells are in the center m cells are in the periphery right sir then the first place where the light energy is converted into neural energy is at the ganglion cells can i shift to the other uh, ipad absolutely sir absolutely sir till then we'll take uh, uh, the notes from uh, pradeep sharma sir and uh, uh, dr amitava sir uh, please take your time till then sir okay i'll go to that i'll start the ipad in a second sure sir Hmm. You see the slides now? Absolutely, sir. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Fine. So we will carry on. Project from this. Yes, sir. Perfectly fine. We have dichotomous processes. A well-organized uh, process from the retina to the part. Yes, sir. No problem. <coughs> Yes, so you have mentioned the parvus cellular and magnus cellular cells. This is that slide. Yeah. Um, uh, ma'am, we are not able to hear, sir. So. Um, uh, ma'am, we are not able to hear, uh, Doctor Santan Gopal, sir. So. Can you hear me now? Perfect, sir. Yeah. 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 Yes, okay, sir. Okay, fine. <clears throat> Good. So now, once you realize that there is a lateral geniculate body, temporal fibers go to lateral geniculate body. Nasal fibers from the other side go to the lateral geniculate body. So there is a dichotomy here. From the lateral geniculate body, they are all strictly segregated. There is no interconnection between nasal and temporal fibers, and they go to B one, the lowest level of Uh, the discharge from the retina into the occipital cortex. However, you must remember, you must remember why are the optic radiations? Now, V one itself is incapable of analyzing the entire vision. So, what it does is it classifies the vision into various object into various types. 
like size of the object, shape of the object, color of the object, movement of the object, its texture of the object. After all, the brain has only um, uh, the action potentials of different varieties. So it groups the various action potentials into various types at V1 and V1 is unable to analyze it. So what it does is it simply forwards it to the extra strayed cortex. So starting from LGN, it's not a simple relay station, you must know, because only 30% of the retinal impulses are forwarded to the cortex from the LGN. And most of the impulses are suppressed at LGN, you must remember. So is the problem in amblyopia at the lateral geniculate body? The answer is perhaps, maybe. But how to stimulate the LGN, we don't know as yet. So once you know this, the dichotomous pathway, retina, magnocellular, parocellular, go to three, four, five, six, layer two, one, and two. So they all reach the cortex. The parocellular goes to infrotemporal cortex, and they are involved in what is called as what of vision. That is size, shape, texture, color. These are the four things analyzed by infrotemporal cortex. They are called extra striate areas. Whereas the magnocellular cells go directly to the superoperatal cortex where the wear of vision is situated. So don't go home with the impression that the wear and what are not connected to each other. They are interconnected to each other from in various places in the, uh, in the throughout the nervous system. You must remember. Otherwise, if you are going out with your girlfriend, you will not notice where your wife is. You will end up with problem. Or if you are going with your wife and you don't notice where your girlfriend is, you will have problems. So you should know where is what and what is where. And that is possible because of the interconnection between the parvocellular and magnocellular pathway in various parts of the brain. So these are the six layers of the cortex. Layer 4 has three layers, A, B and C. And right and left eye are segregated in layer 4 as ocular dominance columns. And M fibers end in layer 4C alpha and P fibers end in layer 4C beta. They are segregated fully. They don't connect. They are not interconnected here, but further up they are interconnected. M cells are involved in the wear of vision, whereas P cells are involved in the visual definition. So as I said earlier, the V1 is incapable of analyzing. So what it does, it says, hey boss, I don't know what these action potentials are, but I have segregated them for you. You analyze them and you send them off to various parts in the extra straight area. So extra straight areas are as important as V1 in vision. From the magnocellular cells, they go to mid-temporal and further they go to ox uh, parietal cortex. So this is how the vision is to start with. Very complex. From occipital cortex, it goes to superoperatal cortex. From occipital cortex, it also goes to infrotemporal cortex. And from each of these areas, the occipital cortex gets reciprocal information. That's very important. Otherwise, the occipital cortex cannot function on its own. It depends on every part of the brain for functioning normally. And that's why occipital cortex was called as the uh, brain was called, Sarvendri, I was called Sarvendriyanam Nayanam Pradhanam. That is, nearly 40% of the afferent impulses reaching the brain are from the two eyes. Can you imagine, from the two eyes, 40% of afferent impulses go and nothing uh, from the other parts, the remaining 60% of the central impulses go to the brain. So, in amblyopia, what happens? There is a functional deficit or a probably a structural deficit in the visual cortex. V1. Is it only in V1? Not really. Because fMRI scans show us the way, for, way forwards. The board scans do show a drastic reduction when you are fixating with amblyopic eye in the brain, which means that the brain cells are not functioning properly, maybe because they are absent, or maybe because they are not functioning properly, which of the two is difficult to decide as of today. So the cortical deficit in V1, primary problem is in V1. Is it really in V1? Not really. V1 is the problem area, but 
it involves a large extra straight areas as shown here because of a problem in the eye. So, but most affected is in the striated cortex, V1 area. So, where in V1 area <coughs> is the is the um, amblyopia a problem of central vision, peripheral vision, or both? Generally, amblyopia is a problem of P cells, that is central vision. The peripheral vision is fairly normal. So, where in V1, where the P cells end? Where do the P cells end? Layer 4C beta. So, there is a problem in layer 4C beta in amblyopia. And also, there is problem in uh, extra straight cortex involving extensive areas or large regions of extra straight cortex in V1. This is the basic of amblyopia. Now, you know that occlusion is the gold standard of treatment of amblyopia. Now, we have many other modalities to analyze and treat amblyopia. Shouldn't we find a more, and also the occlusion is given for months together, eight hours a day, six hours a day, 24 hours a day, etc. Et and you will always find a very sad parent or very unhappy and irritated parent and a very sad child. When you pass the normal eye and the normal eye has 6 6 vision and you leave the amblyopic eye open, which has a vision of just counting fingers. So, what do we do? We just patch. We force the parents and say the patching is the only treatment, which is not. So, shouldn't we utilize all our knowledge from cutting edge technologies like fMRI, DTI, PET, etc., for better approaching the problem in amblyopia? Since we know where the problem is in amblyopia, we know that the problem in amblyopia is at V1 level. Now, how do we reach this V1 level? There are many methods of reaching this V1 level. However, they are all external methods. Now, is there anything that is possible within the body which stimulates the parocellular cells at V1 level? The answer is yes. So, I will come to that in a few seconds. So, we have designed a new instrument called as a magnocellular stimulator or orthoptic. It has got three rows of light and central drone is red in color and lights come on for 300 milliseconds and they are off for 150 milliseconds and they are off for 150 milliseconds. And the patient is seated at a distance of one meter from the machine and the procedure is conducted for 30 minutes. 20 minutes with the amblyopic eye and uh, five minutes with both eyes and five minutes with nor normal eye. Now, amblyopia is a treatment with this has a significant success rate at all ages from 5 to 55 with the present day techniques. We all have been taught old dogs do not learn new tricks. The new adage is old dogs do learn the new tricks. The brain cannot learn new tricks is wrong. The brain does a lot of learning because of various reasons. So, one of the newest treatment devices is orthoptic, which reduces the recovery time from amblyopia to a few weeks for, for as little as 30 minutes a day. And the success rate can easily be estimated at greater than 95% at three to six months of completion. Now, the next question you will ask me, how does this work so quickly and so fast and so rapidly? It works, no doubt. But why should it work? How does it work? So this instrument, we see an improvement in stereo. Amblyopia is generally associated with a problem in stereopsis, a problem in binocular vision, and a problem in monocular vision. However, with orthoptic, we notice improvement in all the three, stereopsis, binocular, and monocular vision. Stereopsis improves and binocular vision improves much before the monocular vision. That's why I have written stereopsis first, which improves as quickly as binocular vision and monocular vision takes some more time to improve. There is a reason for that. We'll come to that later. So normally you have been taught that unless monocular vision improves, stereopsis will not improve. It's incorrect. So stereopsis improves, binocular vision improves, and then the monocular vision in the uh, amblyopic eye improves. And this is sustained even after we stop the treatment for a few months. 
and steatopsis improved more rapidly than the vision in amblyopic and the most patients reached 40 seconds of alpha. So this instrument, as I said, is three rows of light, etc., etc., and I'll show you some statistics. Binocular vision present at presentation in both the groups of patients, anisometropic and strabismic amblyopia, yeah? none of them had binocular vision at when they presented to me. After 15 days of treatment, 100% of patients had binocular vision in the anisometropic group and about 86% had in the strabismic group because they developed a bit of diplopia, the squint has to be corrected. Now, Initial visual acuity is 0.493 and point plus or minus 0.482, where 210 plus or minus 270 in stomach. And you can see the final visual acuity, 0 0.08 and 0 0.07 after 15 days of treatment with orthoptic. So your concept that following occlusion, the vision improves after one to three months is correct, but that is with occlusion. However, we have a newer device which improves within two weeks the vision. In fact, the younger child improves within days, not in weeks. And older adults take some more time. This is initial stereopsis. Initial stereopsis was uh, nil. But if I put zero, it gives wrong impression. So I put it as 3000 before treatment. And after treatment, you can see 45 seconds and 216 seconds in subismic because some of them need it surgery to improve the stereopsis. So don't go home with the impression that orthoptic will prevent you from operating. No, it does not prevent you from operating. However, it reduces the amount of surgery you do on these patients with manifest tropia and abnormal stereopsis. So this I've already told you how the impulses from retina to the cortex and back are involved in uh, amblyopia. So we need not go into it, except to say that in, if you look at this uh, um, box here, you notice that magnocellular cells go to 4C alpha, parvocellular cells go to 4C beta. Let's not worry about corneocellular cells. From there, they go to different parts of the brain. So sensory cortex, you must know, is closely connected to the motor cortex in an orderly fashion. What is this order? This order is called as foveocortical fidelity. What it means is in the cortex, the, red, the fovea as a point in the retina is represented as a point in cortex, both motor and sensory cortex. And a point nasal to the fovea in the retina is represented exactly like that in the cortex, both motor and sensory. And a point above the fovea is represented above, point below the fovea is represented below. So this is the this is what is called as foveocortical fidelity. It's very essential from the point of view of understanding amblyopia and the various anomalies. The retinomotor value of any thing is of any retinal point is decided by the distance of the peripheral retinal point from the fovea. The greater is this, the distance of the peripheral retinal point from the fovea, greater is the movement. Lesser is the, the, the distance from the fovea, lesser is the movement. However, direct foveal stimulation does not stimulate the movement because the fovea ha has less representation in the motor cortex. So therefore, it does not stimulate the um, uh, movement. So, during a saccadic movement, the retina between the fovea and the stimulated peripheral retinal point is suppressed during a saccade. The eye can move whenever you present an object in the periphery. The eye moves in such a way that it take, the fovea takes a fixation on this peripheral stimulus. So, during this movement, this is called as a reflex saccade or a pro saccade. The amount of retinal uh, retina in between the fovea and the, uh, the peripherally stimulated point is suppressed. Okay, now this is what we make use of. This is suppressed by the brain to prevent the smearing effect. So this is possible because of the close connection between the M and P cell pathways at various levels. See what happens is the moment you present a, a, a stimulus in the periphery, the peripheral part of the retina and the peripheral 
part of the brain which is uh, viewing this says to the brain look boss i don't know what it is i am seeing something in the periphery why don't you send your fovea the top man to have a look at it so what does the brain do the brain has to move the eye to bring the fovea onto the object so how does the brain know how much to move the eye well brain knows how much to move the eye because the retinal topography is represented both in sensory and in motor cortex both motor cortex and sensory cortex have exact retinal topography in them so therefore brain knows how much and in which direction the eye has to move so that the fovea is brought to focus on the peripheral point so now you know that retina there are magnocellular cells parvocellular cells that i already told you and the lgn is not a simple real estate the parvocellular cells go to layer 4c beta in v1 magnocellular cells go to layer 4c alpha in v1 from there parvocellular cells go to infratemporal cortex which is concerned with water vision supraparietal cortex which is concerned with layer of vision however the two are interconnected i'll tell you why i am telling you all this because both m cells and p cells ultimately go to primary posterior parietal cortex you see the importance of primary posterior parietal cortex in a few seconds the primary posterior parietal cortex has got an important area which is called as attention area in the treatment of amblyopia we have been neglecting this attention area for a long time now we didn't know what was the function of attention area in parvocellular cell stimulation we also did not know what is the importance of attention area in preventing the saccadic movement of the eye we also did not know what is the function of magnocellular cells in stimulating the saccadic area so in the parietal cortex what happens sensory afferents visual afferents auditory afferents somatosensory and autonomic system all are homogenized that means all are connected together properly that's why it is called as a global sensory motor integration center in the primary posterior cortex what happens attention area is connected to different parts of the cortex including the v1 that's important to know because if you uh, if you are walking on the streets and you step on some rubbish immediately you jump out and you know which leg you have stepped down same way if you are walking on the street and you see your girlfriend is periphery and your wife is not around you are happy but if your wife is around you immediately move the eye out other way and walk away so all these things are possible because the attention area is connected to different parts of the cortex motor and sensory both the saccadic area in the cortex again which is otherwise called as saccadic generation area He is interconnected with attention area. When the attention area is strongly stimulated, the saccadic area is inhibited. When the saccadic area is strongly stimulated, the attention area is diverted or inhibited, and the eye moves to take up the same attention to another new object in the periphery. So that is possible because the saccadic generation area in the in the parietal cortex. is strongly connected to frontal eye field area and superior collicular area which are involved in v1 now what's the importance of knowing all this in treating amblyopia i will tell you one second the different parts of the cortex they are all connected to layer 4c beta and v1 that's important to remember that they are connected to 4c beta which receives the parvocellular cells so the next question arises when the peripheral retinal point is stimulated sudden appearance of light the eyes make a saccadic movement to take a fixation of the light and this movement is in a specific direction and a specific amount which is dependent on the retinal fovea retinal cortical fidelity that's important to understand so away from the fovea object greater the movement closer to the fovea object lesser the movement hence fovea has less representation in the motor eye field area and therefore it has almost zero retinal motor value now sudden appearance of the light causes stimulation of saccadic movement which is associated with stimulation of fovea in v1 how is this saccadic movement 
simulating phobia via the top down impulses you saw that the saccadic movement in the previous picture here attention area sense impulses to v1 where to layer for c beta and v1 and that is what is called as the top down stimulation or top down impulses they come from attention area in the parietal lobe sudden appearance of the light stimulation of saccadic movement with stimulation of fovea in v1 and suppression of the retinal area between fovea and peripherally stimulated point which is a mechanism by the brain to avoid this smearing effect so repeated stimulation of magnocellular cells in the periphery or m cells automatically lead to stimulation of fovea so pro circuit is associated with maximal stimulation of v1 area and as i told you earlier v1 area is a simply forwarding area it just for forwards the image which it gets or the impulses which it gets but is unable to do anything more however what the extra straight areas do is analysis of the impulses coming to v1 area which i already told you now if the if the attention area in the peripheral cortex in the parietal cortex is stimulated the impulses come down from the attention area to v1 area and these impulses are called top down impulses and they are they accelerate the image forwarding from v1 10000 times to extra straight areas which actually analyze the impulses so you can understand why the vision improves in this orthopedic instrument 90% of the patients recover from amblyopia in my series the treatment is orthopedic because it improves the vision stereopsis and there is an improvement in hand eye coordination which improves the handwriting of children they feel very happy and it improves the self confidence in children because attention area you must remember is connected to the convergent center and divergent center of the brain attention area is, con con is connected to the convergent center more than to the divergent center and therefore medial recti act more medial recti are stronger not because the muscle is any stronger but because a greater area of attention area is devoted to the medial rectus compared to the divergent center so improvement of the squint improves the self confidence of children and there is reduced nystagmus and there is reduced strabismus so i am an orthopedic graduate now after listening to this so from this you can realize two or three things as a student number 1 that most of the parvocellular discharge go to layer 4 c beta and v1 most of the layers of magnocellular go to layer 4 c alpha and v1 however there is an interconnection between these two and some p fibers also go to the parietal area and some m cells also go to the uh, along with parvocellular cells they go to 4 c beta this interconnection is what we are exploiting in addition to the top down impulses coming from the parietal cortex attention area in the parietal cortex to the parvocellular cells so we have realized that this attention area is very very important in the treatment of amblyopia now how do you grab the attention of attention area well you stimulate the peripheral retinal cells when you stimulate the peripheral retinal cells they either inhibit the attention area to move the eye or if the attention area is strong the saccadic area is inhibited so therefore the magnocellular stimulation should be strong enough to inhibit the attention area to start with and then they stimulate the attention area again when the eye takes a fixation the new object of regard so this timing is very essential between stimulation and suppression when the parvocellular cells are strongly stimulated they are, the the information from the parvocellular cells do not reach beyond layer 4c beta because there is a suppression at level 4c beta level 
So if you stimulate the magnocellular cells, what happens is the attention area sends the top-down impulses or the so-called uh, uh, image forwarding center, image facilitating center, and these top-down impulses discharge before layer 4 C beta synapse, at the synapse, and after the synapse. And therefore, the suppression does not matter to the top-down impulses. Are the top-down impulses normally present? The answer is yes. How do we know that the top-down impulses are present? The answer is if you do multi-point uh, electro uh, encephalography, you will see the so-called alpha and beta waves. Alpha and beta waves coming down from the parietal lobe into occipital lobe. And if these come before 150 milliseconds of the arrival of impulses from the retina to the cortex as gamma waves, they stimulate the fast forwarding of the gamma waves. And that's how the vision improves in amblyopia. So we have been doing patching, hoping that the bottom up impulses will improve but it does not improve very much. It does improve to a small extent, but you cannot rule out the so-called eye movement, involvement in the improvement of vision while patching the eye. So I think I'll stop at this level. If you have any questions, you can ask me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gopal. I think um, instead of a very conventional approach for therapy, the uh, the talk that you have given is a different approach and maybe based on your disruptive thinking, which is innovative and interesting, but I think we have to still uh, get more uh, results uh, and it's probably under research. So let's uh, wish you best and see that someday we have uh, the results also coming in to support this novel approach of your uh, treatment of amblyopia. Uh, in the meantime, I think, Rolika, if you have any questions from the people, yes, sir. maybe because we are running short of time, so let's have those sure, questions. Sure, sir. Uh, sir, could you explain the basis of uh, Heidinger blush in the treatment of amblyopia? Sorry, sir. Oh, Heidinger brushes, they thought that they will stimulate the P-cells in the central area, macular fibers. Now, However much you stimulate the retinal macular fibers, they get suppressed at level 4C beta. Correct? If 100 impulses are going, one impulse may go across. If 200 impulses are sent, maybe four impulses may go across. But not all the 100 impulses go across the suppression area in the layer 4C beta. Now, what I am doing is I'm avoiding the suppression at level 4C beta by using top-down impulses, which are normally present. It's not that top-down impulses are not present at all. They are normally present and identified on EEG as alpha and beta waves. Okay? I think the, the question is about the hiding of brushes. And uh, I mean, are you using them in your approach? If not, then probably you can... Huh. I think maybe, yeah. So I think the question uh, has to be answered as it has been asked. What is the role of hiding mm -hmm. up? And hiding up are not very effective in the treatment of amblyopia for the reason I explained that they are hoping that maximal stimulation occurs at the paravascular cells or in the macular area. <laughs> Therefore, more stimulation happens and passes across the 4C beta. It doesn't. The suppression doesn't. The question may be answered a little differently that basically the Heidinger brushes are a part of treatment in eccentric fixation cases. When we want to restore the central fixation to the fovea, then Heidinger brushes is a mechanism because of the fact of their uh, Polaroid filtration property being only at the fovea because of the lutein pigment or also because of the ONL layer, the uh, Henley's layer, which gives the property of uh, polarization. And using the Polaroid light, we are able to stimulate the fovea and the uh, foveocortical pathways. So this was intended by Cooper and in his approach of treating cases of amblyopia with eccentric fixation. So these are much severe amblyopes with eccentric fixation in which we would like to shift the central fixation back to the fovea. Yeah. 
that is the reason why Hedinger brushes would have a role because they have the only part of retina which has a property of polarization is there. Okay, sir. However, point I would like to make is that the fixation of an area of the retina is dependent on the foveal cortical fidelity. So a point eccentric situated to with respect to phobia cannot have zero retinomotor value because in the motor cortex they are represented as nasal or temporal or whatever due to the foveal cortical fidelity. So when you say eccentrically fixating, does it mean that eccentrically fixating has zero retinomotor value? The answer is no. Retinomotor value zero is with the eccentric fixation point. That's right. So in pleoptics, the concept is that first we are going to suppress that uh, eccentric point by flashing it with light and then giving the central fix, uh, property to the fovea. Uh, that was uh, initially the pleoptophore with Bengartas approach and then the Cooper's yeah. method. So these are speci specifically for uh, amblyopia, severe amblyopia with eccentric fixation and uh, yeah. as part of pleoptics therapy. So the question was, I think, very, very uh, focused to that part of uh, pleoptics therapy. I think, so I yeah. think having a brush is the second step after we have given some central fixation to the fovea, uh, restored it back, then probably heading a brushes are in order to reinforce that. Point. Right, so, sir. Any other question, Rolika? Yes, sir. There's one more question, sir, by Dr. Hashi. How to improve the compliance of treatment and how to measure the compliance for the children with no visual improvement? Okay. No. So, I mean, how to improve? How, Carry how on to improve it with orthoptic. Would you like me to repeat? Would you the like question? to give the answer other than orthoptic? Because it's fine. If we have heard uh, something, but they would like to know something about the conventional approach too. So could you give some uh, information on that, please? Patching. Patching. The, uh, see, the difficulty of patching and improving the compliance of the child with a vision of just 660 or less than 660 in the amblyopic, not an unusual finding, is very, very difficult. Because the child become, will become inactive or will peep over the occlusion or pull the occlusion and the parents are not watching and things like that. So there are ways of improving the occlusion of special glasses right. which cost at least at the moment in, in India they cost about 35 or 40,000 rupees. Uh, I think Pradeep Sharma will be able to tell more about those uh, glasses that they use which keep changing the occlusion from yeah, right angle I think to left Those are again another different approach which we have not uh, recommended and we don't use uh, those things but the other ways to improve the compliance would be one simple talking to the child motivating him to use occlusion. Secondly, the parents also to be brought into that and be uh, explained that this is a very important part. There are special devices like the occl occlusion um, monitors, which are based on uh, ODM. Yeah, ODM. So occlusion dose ODM. monitors. So those are uh, another way, but that's a little more of a research tool. Practically, what we do is that we will try to motivate the child and see that the compliance is established. And many a times, if you talk to the child in a very positive manner, he would be compliant enough. The other thing you have to see is what is the presenting vision. If the presenting vision itself is less than 6 by 60, then obviously patching the good eye would make him almost semi-blind. And we would not be expecting compliance from such a child. So that would fall into a different category. And we have to be very, very uh, concerned about this fact. In which case should we start occlusion and when? So usually right, the vision has to be 6 by 60 or better uh, in order to have a good, good compliance. Or maybe yes, you have to give an occlusion for some time as a trial basis for a week or so with the instruction to the parents that you may try it. And if it is not being used, then we will have to come back and see what next to be done. Right, uh, with my device, with our top deck, I just give a chocolate to the child. And say, if you look at these slides properly with this eye, I'll give you one more chocolate. And they are very <laughs> compliant. There's absolutely no problem. The only problem is, if I don't have a patient, then I keep eating chocolate and sugar. <laughs> so I keep the chocolate minimum vision you have tried with orthoptic? 
Sir, <clears throat> how much is the vision minimum which you have tried or topic? Three by sixty. Three by sixty. Okay. Three by sixty. Doctor Mitawa, comment yes, please. Doctor yes, Mitawa, I just wanted to add that um, you know there could there could be issues of compliance, especially if the child is uh, you know if you are kind of keen to have the patch in school, because there other children will tend to tease the child. So it might be yes. a, a more comfortable environment is to start it at home. And as the pediatric studies have shown, even a lower dose of patching works pretty well compared to uh, you know higher dose of patching. And don't forget that there is penalisation also as an option where where children are offended with the patch. There are many ways to skin the cat, they say. You have occlusion, dose meter, <laughs> penalisation, organisation, and uh, uh, the recent drug they have described for amblyopia. Give it for six weeks, eight weeks, and then stop, and then restart, and etc. etc. And I do encourage mothers to reward the child, but not with chocolates and such thing. But maybe make his his or her favorite food. That way, I mean, I I feel is a better way to go about than you know. And you know, the kind of people I am dealing with in Aligarh uh, can't afford these uh, fancy things. So, uh, a home cooked food, which is the fav child's favorite, is a great way to reward the child. The reward that we usually incentivize the child is to during the occlusion time, he may be allowed to watch TV for an hour or the games that he wants to play. So that works both ways. One is it's a reward, plus yes. also it's stimulating the amblyopic eye to be used actively. So I think that yeah. is what we generally say that you can let them uh, have the uh, watching of TV or the uh, uh, video games during that time, video game. and even that can be kept as a condition that if you will patch for six hours, then one hour of this will be allowed to you, or two hours we may give you. So that is one positive mm. reward that mm. we talk about. You're right, sir. Correct. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for all your inputs, sir. and thank you, Dr. Santan, sir, for uh, coming and uh, taking out your time for the same. And thank you, Dr. Amita, sir. Thank you, Dr. Pradeep Sharma, sir, for your inputs. And uh, uh, would you like to say something, Dr. Pradeep Sharma, sir? So I think thank uh, you, Rika, for uh, in carrying out the thing in spite of the glitches that we had of uh, some. Uh, so it was a disruptive talk, and it was a disruptive. Uh, technology which was working <laughs> here, so we had some disruptions to be there. So I think, in spite of all that, we uh, could get through the people with uh, a little different approach. Maybe we can have a more conventional approach of occlusion also talked about in some subsequent talks, right. so that we can cover up that. I would like to thank you, Dr. Santan Gopal, for this talk, and Dr. Amitava for co-chairing, and of course, Dr. Deepthi for starting the uh, ball. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Sure. Thank you so much, Santan, sir, for taking Thank out your time and coming for us. Uh, so the next session will be on August 10th. That is on neuromuscular anomalies, classification and terminologies, etiology of heterophoria and heterotropia by Dr. Amar Pujari, sir. Thanks again to everybody for uh, being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.